that had actually stormed um, the beach at Okinawa and done things like that or had firebombed the wooden villages was another thing a lot of people don't know about. Oh, yeah. they, um, they went and met the same counterparts that were in that survived the battles they were both in and they were just happy to see each other yeah that psychologically they'd gotten past all of that stuff and it's you sometimes you might expect it to be different but it was pretty amazing I mean, we knew yep. what the cities and everything we did made of stuff and, uh, yeah. we had a place sitting out in the desert where we practiced firebombs we perfected mm -hmm. the firebomb just yeah. the they built buildings the same way the Japanese did and then firebombed them so they would know all the technicalities yep. and they firebombed part of the problem was is the Japanese simply wouldn't quit yep. even if tactically and see that's the difference between the Japanese model and the German old school like honorable warrior model if the honorable warrior knew that he was beaten he would surrender and if someone surrendered to him he would treat him like a fellow chess player take good care of him but you're locked up that's it you're done um, the Japanese would torture and, and kill and humiliate yeah you weren't a living human being you were dishonorable animal there's a there's a bunch of movies about that subject if you go look over bridge over the river Kwai. Oh, the river Kwai is a great movie. That's a good one. Very popular movie. There's, and there's and there's liberties that they took, but it's a great movie. Yeah. All movies have to take liberties, but they're they can be instructive if you keep in mind the, the biases, yeah. liber, limit limitations. Yeah. It's got some good. There's some good stuff. Yeah. Read, watch, and about them. Just talking to the guys. I mean, there's a friend of mine's dad was in Vietnam, and uh, he drank beer and he smoked and I drank beer and I smoked it and his son did I mean his son drank beer and he didn't smoke and I'd go out there and, and I'd walk out with him and smoke a cigarette and we'd sit there and smoke a cigarette and drink beer and I'm just sitting there and we'd just be you know shooting the breeze and next thing you know he's talking about the long time I never asked anything he just started talking he could tell his story so good I mean we were in South Georgia the last time we got to sit and talk about it he was in South Georgia sitting across oh, from the get field. going. All right, buddy. We'll see you. Yeah, we should definitely get a drink or something one day. Yeah, I'll, so, at me. I'll shoot you a text. Thanks for letting you. me we'll film. You. you guys have a great day. Well, we were sitting there, and the way he told the story, you can swear Charlie was in the tree. And Sean, my buddy, he got a little upset with me. One day he was like, man, you know more about the dance service than I do. And I'm like, hey, Sean, just sit out here. He ain't got smoke to sit out there. I mean, that's all I'm doing. <laughs> I mean, I know everything. I know about how he got shot. I know, you know, how he ran into a guy that was now flying a DEA plane that used to fly in with choppers and all kinds of stuff. And granddaddy, me and granddaddy be in the middle of a project. He started talking about World War II. He was talking about they, because when they did convoys going places, the first guy, when they made a turn, they'd drop out two guys. And so they could motion the rest of them where to go. And then the last truck would pick them up or whatever. And so him and another guy had to hop out in a motion, and they were in this town. I forget what town it was, but they started hearing they started hearing German talking, and you know the shoes. And so they got into a door well, in the shadow of the door well, and Granddad was like, "Okay, grab your grenades. If they spot us, pull the pin, throw it, and run like hell." And Granddad was like, "They were all huddled up in the shadow, and a whole machine gun company went by." <laughs> Really? <laughs> and there's there's two levels if you study like especially World War II is a good example there's two levels of the story there's the personal experiences which are finite in location and finite in personal knowledge in the field as they as they went and then there's the management stuff and both have lessons to teach us not just about war but also about how history evolves and how business involves. You look at right after World War II, the guys that came out of there, a lot of them went straight into business back in the United States or in other parts of the world. And they had, they had learned po new possibilities, right? Washers and dryers for personal homes, um, uh, common roads for cars, bridges, for road for large vehicles and high traffic 
that was all new after World War II. And it affected things like marriages. Prior to World War II, the, the average housewife was a technician. She washed all the clothes, she preserved all the food, she made all, all the clothes. Most of the time, uh, if she wasn't making cloth, she was buying cloth to make clothing. It was very common. She also was uh, a nurse and a doctor for the house because she knew treatments for all kinds of common things. And so did the fathers. The fathers often were instructed by the wives, I need this plant, I need some of this, I need some of this, we're short on meat go do this and they would go out into the world gather ma raw materials and bring them back and they were craftsmen in their own right but after World War II you saw an increase in specialization and in part you can go back to 1950s uh, TV commercials for electric products he, he hears it he, he laughs because they're campy as hell they're really fun to watch but when you look at the divorce rate after and you look at the effect on on the size of families and you go and read books like um uh what's the name third wave by alvin toffler remember that third wave by alvin toffler he talks about systemic societal functions after world war ii a lot of the systematic components of society were dramatically different and nobody was sure what it was going to do everything changed, especially in my generation like i see it all the time my homes change the way people talk with each other's change like mm -hmm. personally like this is me mm -hmm. back in the day people used to dress up i dress up because yeah, i noticed you look pretty nice yeah i, I just short. thank you man and i just i love to look good so i you know presentable yeah. but like today people like to just like dress down more like my generation i think there's i think there's also um a con context thing there's a thing where people have said for a while context is for kings if you look at my context I've been homeless since I got religion in 2012 I became a Muslim and I became a Muslim with almost no clue about the religion at all for evidential reasons I knew the path was right I didn't know all the details and my family turned away from me my job were turned away from me I started getting um, tested and problematic situations happen all the time and cops give me a hard time as soon as I got religion there's reasons for that that took me a long time to figure out but when you don't have a choice about having access to clean clothes you look at the war experience the way he's dressed right now would have been approved by uh, I forget what the general was that yelled at the one guy for shell shock Patton Patton was a, a stickler about being presentable but if you look at pictures of the GIs in the field that had that had been several months into the campaigns they didn't shave their clothes were kind of random and torn up uh, their weapons were in good order and working <laughs> and they didn't give a shit about rules or anything. No, they didn't. So like they cared say, about their brother and killing them on the sure other side of the field. Make sure they're weapon was right. <laughs> so you could basically, in summary, say like how you dress and things like that is based off of like the place you're in in society? It's your context of the situation. Oh, context. Okay, okay, place in society is a component of the context of your situation. The, the context of the honor the level of respect that a guy in a GI uniform that had been three months in the field in the European theater, you go back and ask